How's it going, Eliminators? Today, we're gonna to be having a look at a generator that I picked up as kind of like a wholesale deal because it does have some significant damage to it. And in today's video, we're pretty much just gonna be seeing whether or not this unit is worth me putting a little bit of money into so that one day I can hopefully sell it and make a little bit of a profit. So with that being said, let's get right into it. So in the shop today, I'm working on a Champion 4450. Now that is just the watts that it puts out when it first starts. Technically is a 3550, that's the running watts. So you'll commonly hear me refer to this thing as like a 3500 or 3600 watt generator. And as you can see, this thing does have a little bit of damage. And that is the reason why I got such a good deal on this thing, because I don't even know if it's gonna start I don't know anything about it and I didn't even pull over the recoil to see if the engine would turn over because this thing is literally brand new, does not have any oil in it. This thing actually fell out of the back of a truck. Now, normally that's a saying, right? And everybody knows what that means. In this case, this unit actually fell out of the back of a truck. Pretend the ground is here. So it kind of slid off the back end and slammed up against the air filter side, which we're lucky because on the other side of the unit, is the end piece of the generator as well as the muffler. So that would have been a little bit more expensive to replace than plastic air filter cover. But we're gonna get into that in a moment. I'm gonna do basically a full damage report. We're gonna see what's wrong with this thing, what's kind of broken and the parts that I may need to replace. And then we'll go ahead and put some oil into it. I'll pull it over because you really don't wanna turn an engine over, you know, rotate the engine by pulling the recoil cord when there's no oil in the engine because you could damage the crankshaft journals you know they attach to the connecting rods and they're spinning without lubrication not good once there's oil in it and i can turn it over i can do two things check for spark and compression if we have both of those things then maybe i can put some fuel into it and just see if i can get this thing to fire up so starting off with the damage report clearly frame has been bent right so like i said thing fell off the back of a truck and the whole frame just kind of tilted sideways. Now this is a tubular frame, so I'm thinking I'll be able to just remove the fuel tank and this front plastic cover, and then I can just kind of bend the tube frame back as straight as I can get it. The fuel tank itself is metal and connects to the upper frame via what I think is going to be like maybe four or six bolts. So the fuel tank is not damaged. However, this front plastic console, when the tubular frame tilted, you guys can see it separated there and that's the recoil handle box. So when you pull this, this whole thing moves and that's not really that great. So we can possibly look into replacing this plastic console. We can see here it's broken as well because what I'm thinking is obviously I could like, you know, glue that thing back together, maybe a bit of JB Weld and some bracing. But if I wanna sell this thing and, you know, maximize my profits, then possibly looking into a replacement panel would be worth it. Coming over to this side of the machine, I've already removed the air filter housing because I wanted to have a look at the carburetor back there because when this thing fell, it fell on this side and the air filter housing cover, that is cracked. And then if we flip this around, the back side of the air filter housing is all dented and deformed in there. So it landed on something. Now the fuel valve is coming out at a weird angle. So I'm not sure if that kind of bent as well, but we'll be able to test that after, like I said, oil, pull it over. If it's got spark and compression, maybe put some fuel through it and see if it flows to the carb. As for the carburetor, it really doesn't look like anything's damaged. Plastic choke lever, perfectly fine as well. So we may have got lucky on that. And then coming to the back side, you know, overhead valve cover, spark plug wire, and then the muffler, like I said, generator cover. You know, there really doesn't appear to be all that much damage on this thing. So I may have lucked out and got myself a good deal. Now, because this is a brand new generator, obviously it comes with an operator's manual. Here's the model number in case you guys wanted to look this up. It's a 100459 Champion 3550 
generator here and uh, it has a 224 cc engine on it so first things first let's get some oil into this thing it takes 10 w30 you can see here put it up to the threads and if it's not at the dipstick then you're below your minimum these engines are very similar to the Honda GX series engines, so I'm going to be starting off with approximately 550 milliliters of 10W30. So once again, oil pretty much up to the threads, 550 mils, 10W30, that's it. So our oil is in, now I can pull the engine over safely. So next up, I have removed the spark plug cap right there, also referred to as a high tension lead. And this spark plug area has this like weird plastic cover. So it's kind of hard to get spark plug socket in there. So what I'm doing is I'm gonna use my gap type spark tester plugged into the spark plug cap here. And then I've hooked the other end onto the tip of the spark plug. Now, what's nice about using the gap type spark tester is you have this little electrode tip there and you can thread it out or thread it in. Now, the farther of a gap that your spark jumps, the stronger the spark your coil is producing. So basically, you know, I just like to put it somewhere near the first line and then we're gonna pull it and look for spark. So because I don't wanna pull this engine over by hand while looking for spark, I've used my impact to remove the three 10 millimeter bolts that hold the recoil housing onto the cover. And then I'm going to be using my drill and a socket to spin the flywheel nut right back there. And then what that'll allow is the magnet on the flywheel to pass the coil. And then that should give us a nice spark reading on our spark tester. Now, if you're not sure which way to spin the engine, all you have to do is look at your recoil housing. You can see that the rope comes out on the top, which means as you pull it, it's going to rotate the flywheel clockwise from this direction. So I'm going to be rotating my drill clockwise. Quick little test to see if the engine is seized engine is not seized and it does spin over so I'll spin it and test for spark make sure we set the engine shutoff switch to run and let's see if we have spark you can see we were even arcing off of the backside there so ideally you would want to have this thing in a position like this holding on to it by the plastic handle knob up there but this thing has all kinds of spark which is a good sign it turns over very easily with the spark plug still in it, so the next thing I might do is test for compression, or I might just throw some fuel in this thing and see if I can get it fired up. As you guys can see, this thing is brand new. It's never even seen fuel. Probably a little bit of oil at the factory when they run the engine, because I think they run all the engines. Then they drain the oil out of them to ship them overseas. And then what happens is, I've said this in previous videos, a lot of people on new equipment, they pull the dipstick out to check the oil and the dipstick still has oil on it. So the dipstick will be wet. However, there won't be any oil in the engine. So they see that dipstick, they say, oh yeah, the oil's good. And they put that back in, they run the engine and then they end up blowing them up or seizing them up completely because there's absolutely no oil in the bottom end. So you always wanna wipe the dipstick off put it back in and then take it back out if you're ever not sure what the oil level is in your outdoor power equipment. So here's why we test things. I put a very small amount of fuel in here and we can see that we are leaking from the bottom plastic. So when this thing got a little bit of impact, it might've cracked the little sediment bowl for the shutoff valve. Not a big deal, I can always change one of those out. All right, so it appears that we're not leaking from the fuel valve itself, but from the area in which the fuel tank connects to the fuel valve. So there could be a small hairline crack somewhere on the bottom of the fuel tank. So what I'm gonna do now is remove the fuel valve so that I can inspect the bottom end there. So fuel valve's over on the workbench here. I have the fuel valve currently shut off with my Stens carburetor pressure tester, but that's five PSI, zeros down here. We're holding, and that's a good sign. That means that this shutoff valve is not leaking. So it's the connection between the shutoff valve and the fuel tank where the leak is happening. So it was leaking up around the base of the fuel tank and then dripping down, you know, so that's why I thought maybe this plastic was cracked down there. So now what we're gonna do is open the fuel valve. And then when I do that, the pressure should, yeah, drop down just like that. And then 
if I try to pump this up here, there should be no pressure. So that means that it will flow when the fuel valve is open. And then if I turn it to the other shutoff position, because you can go one of two ways, and then I pump this up, see if I can get it on a shot here. See that? So we're holding there as well. You can also do a test to see if the shutoff valve is leaking at the actual valve itself when it's in the open position. So basically you just wanna plug the one end and then pressure test the other end. And you can see there we're holding at five PSI. And then when I let go, it releases the pressure. So we're not leaking internally. We're not leaking there when it's on and we're not leaking there when it's off either. We're also not leaking at the sediment bowl. So shutoff valve's perfectly fine. And you can see I've just tilted this back. So the fuel that I did put into the fuel tank is now at the back. So it's not leaking from where it was before. So I think what I'm gonna do now is pull the fuel tank off because it looks like it's only four bolts. I can pick it up and slide it out this way. Still have the console with all my switches and everything hooked up and then I can basically just use anything. A little small fuel tank that I have. We'll put some fuel into there. See if I can get this thing to fire up. This one's a little harder to get to because the plastic console is here. So I'm just removing this one by hand. Now this fuel tank does have a vapor tube that is connected at the frame. So instead of disconnecting all that, I'm just gonna unplug it from up here. And because this thing is such a small unit, the fuel tank just comes out like that. So even with the damage to the frame, the space in between is still the same. Fuel tanks over here on the workbench, a little bit easier to see what's going on now. So I guess the way they do it is they put the threaded piece in and then they weld it from the outside there. So when this thing, you know, hit, fell off the truck there and whatever it impacted, it pretty much just separated the weld from the bottom of the fuel tank. So what I'm gonna do is I'll drain the fuel out of this thing and then I'll end up getting this TIG welded right there because fuel vapor in a tank, extremely dangerous. That thing will explode and you don't wanna hurt yourself. So what you do is you're gonna drain the fuel out, you're gonna air this thing out, you're gonna hook a compressor up to it, blow all the fumes out of it and get those welds back fused again and then that should solve the leak and then obviously take like a file or something to clean them up and then that will ensure that the little o-ring there and the lock nut on the fuel valve make a good seal so at least with the fuel tank off now gives me a look at the top of the engine as well as the generator all the aluminum casting looks to be in excellent condition all the plastic and metal around the muffler does but it allows us to see that when the frame tilted and it just broke the welds off all of that is mild steel so that can just be welded up using my mig welder so i'm going to get some kind of a fuel tank going here maybe just enough to fill the bowl also just wanted to give a big shout out to both pro fuels for sending us some of this alkalate engineered four cycle fuel this fuel will work in any of your four cycle outdoor power equipment. And if you put this into a fuel tank, will last for up to two years and will last for up to three to five years sitting on a shelf in an unopened container. So I have my fuel tank off of my engine test stand and this thing has all kinds of gunk in it. But the cool thing is it has its own in tank fuel filter, similar to the Honda style. I have fuel shutoff valves on it. And then I've just plugged in a smaller fuel line to downsize, like a little step down there. I'm gonna plug that into the carb and then put some of that fuel into there, just enough to fire this thing up and get it to run. So I'm just holding the fuel tank up for a second here, just to see if I can get the bowl to fill. And then I'll go ahead and fire this thing up. All right, guys, moment of truth here. Switch is on, choke is on. See how many pulls it takes. While this thing fired right up, first pull runs pretty good. 
Now, obviously, when I run this thing, I am going to be braking in the engine, and that's going to be running it for the first five hours because what's going to happen is as that crankshaft rotates and pistons are moving up and down, there's going to be some small metal shavings that come off of the rotating assemblies. Perfectly normal, but they're going to settle to the bottom of the oil sump pan, and you want to get them out of your engine because you don't want them circulating around your engine and causing damage. So generally, the rule of thumb on any new piece of equipment is you're going to run it for five hours and then change the oil. So now that I know this engine runs, it's going to be worth me investing a little bit of money into to make it look new and presentable. So I have opened up the manual that came with this machine. It has an illustrated parts listing, commonly referred to as an IPL. And we can also see some specifications for the engine. So you're gonna see here, capacity is 0 0.6 liters. So that's 600 milliliters. You'll remember we put 550 milliliters into it. That's okay, like I said, I'm gonna run this thing, break it in and change the oil anyways. And the generator may have been off level sitting inside of my garage. Also, it takes an F6 RTC spark plug. So that's gonna be a torch. Normally I like to change them out for a BPR6 ES. They're a little bit of a higher quality plug. We can come over here to the manual, have a look at the IPL. And this is the part that I'm going to need right here, the plastic console. And that's going to be part number 57 on the IPL. So flipping over to the next page, we can see item number 57 is going to be the control box CSA. And we can see that the champion part number is that right there. So I'll write that number down because that's one of the parts that I'm going to buy. Flipping over to the next page, we can see our air box assembly here. Now the air filter and the inner piece is not damaged. Neither is this center little gasket piece. The outer plastic, number 99, and the rear housing that bolts to the carburetor, number 14, is damaged. So I'm going to see if I can order number 99 and 14 separately. If not, I'll order number 18, which is going to be the complete air box assembly with a brand new air filter. But again, if I don't have to spend that money for the extra parts, I won't because the air filter on this unit is brand new, of course, because this generator is brand new. So we can see part number 14, air cleaner base. That's going to be this champion part number right here. And then if we flip over and go to part number 99, air cleaner cover, we can see that's the outer plastic one and that's champion number right there. As far as the frame goes, like I said, I can weld up any cracks on the mild steel and the fuel tank, I'm going to basically flush it out, air it out, and then I'll get that small little hairline crack TIG welded. So that'll make a nice clean weld on that. As you saw, we tested the fuel valve and it pressurized when the fuel valve was off and it flowed when the fuel valve was on, meaning the fuel valve is perfectly fine and it was just a leak coming from the bottom of the tank. And then I did a couple things off camera. One was using my pro point pliers here, grabbed a hold of the fuel valve and just bent it so it's a little straighter now. So instead of being off on an angle, the thing is coming out at a 90 degree. So like I said, I can uh, unthread that and we'll get that TIG welded up. So at least I can reuse this tank because you know what a shame it would be to order a whole new tank and pay the money. I'm sure, you know, this being a metal tank, this is going to be a fairly expensive part. So if I can fix that while well, the rest of the tank is still good and I can save myself a little bit of money on that. And then the second thing that I did off camera was when I was running it, I shut it off because I didn't want to run it in here too long. And I don't want to run it outside because right now it's super cold out and we're actually getting quite a bad snowstorm out there. So after I shut this thing off, I hooked up my angle grinder to the 120 volt outlet there fired it up quick again and just turned on the angle grinder. Sure enough, the generator side of this generator works. So even though I didn't test the bigger plugs, I'm assuming that if those work, then they all work, which is good. So this thing is definitely worth sinking a little bit of money into. So with that being said, that's going to wrap up the first part of this video series on this Champion generator here. I'm gonna be contacting Champion. I'll order the parts that I need. Hopefully they have these parts in stock so that I don't have to wait too long. Hopefully shipping isn't delayed that much either. And then once I get the new parts in, I'll bring you back. We'll remove this front console, get the frame straightened out, welded, get all the new parts on it and see if I can sell this thing for a profit. So stay tuned for part two. Well, that's gonna wrap up today's video. If you guys enjoyed the video, think about leaving me a thumbs up. You know, it really helps me out. You can click here to subscribe and click over here to watch one of my previous videos. I upload every single week. So be sure to stop on by next week, check channel up for new content. And as always, guys, thanks for watching.